All right, so today is April 25th, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. What is our topic of the day? Um, Anyone have any questions from last week? Not really. I, I don't have questions on last week. It would be. I, I was thinking we should maybe uh, expand on. Um, I don't know different things. Um, we were talking about med before the meeting. We were talking about meditation. Um, I was asking a question because I find it nearly impossible to meditate outside because I'm on alert all the time for whatever can happen. And inside, it's okay. But in nature and outside, my brain is constantly making me open my eyes and want to be, um, I don't know, like my cat, just, you know, like this, what, what's going to happen? Um, I wanted to ask um, Hugh uh, what you what you think about this. So... Can't you find a place which has, I mean, it's hard in uh, where you live in Ireland is to, to find a grove of trees or a forest? Uh, like in in Connemara, yes. In, in Ireland, no, but here, yeah. But you can experience, yeah, no, there's nothing where you can. Isn't there really like Sutwick place that's like filled with? Yeah, there is. There is. I have a place like that down. Yeah, I have. I have a place like that. But even there. Every I hear a sound from the wind or the sea or a branch, and I'm. No, so, so the thing is to incorporate it. So the the idea is that you don't let your attention fly away out to that sound, but you stay kind of in your body, embodied kind of awareness, and just recognize that sound coming in. And then you kind of rest in, in that sound. But you, you kind of make sure, you know, you, am I making sense about how your attention flies out to concentrate on that sound as opposed to keeping your attention focused internally and just hearing that sound coming to you rather than you flying out to it? Does that make any sense? Yeah, but if, you're, if, you, if you can't open your eyes, if I can't open my eyes, I feel that I... I can't continue. Uh, I have to, I don't know. I do it with your eyes open. Yeah, uh, yeah just, just um, defocus your eyes and uh, even cross your eyes and look at the tip of your nose. Um, uh, yeah, if, if, if it's an effort to shut your eyes, don't, don't bother, it's, you, mm -hmm. that's not necessary. I was wondering if we didn't need, as humans, um, in nature, as we are animals that are um, aware of our environment and the dangers around us, and that our reptilian brain is on alert. If there is, if we shouldn't be meditating in a cave or inside a house or in a hole or somewhere where we're completely protected, three hundred and sixty degrees, that there can't be anything attacking you, and then you can be totally in a sort of kind of space uh, yes. I, yes. so, so uh, birds bird song helps because I am. we've evolved to know that if birds are singing then there's probably not a predator around if you're in a forest and it suddenly goes deathly quiet without bird song that's a cue a deep cue to us that uh, there's a predator and so you won't be able to relax in a forest um, without you know bird song and stuff like that unless unless it's a very special kind of place but i think it, in ireland i imagine that there are those kind of fairy circles and special places and sacred trees and so you, you know put your back up against a tree like that that's also a good protection but but, I mean, there's some places here where you you must not fall asleep in fairy places because well, well, that's why that we, you you should you you, <laughs> you don't want to yeah that's that's a very good thing is that you shouldn't fall asleep 
yeah. But and also you, you could also climb a tree and you know sit in the branch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, uh, it makes us a part. I used to do that as a kid. We used to do. Uh, I tell you, I'm only realizing now how what a great childhood I probably had. But we used to climb up into this mulberry tree as kids and like eat you know all the fruit off the tree. And it's such a good experience. I mean, you really get in touch with your primate thing. And then we'd sit in the tree in the branches um, afterwards and kind of just kind of meditate. And you really get to know your your chimp side doing that. It's uh, a great shame that we can't get our food that way. Yeah. We might have to soon. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's a, it's kind of weird because... You, there's a kind of shame in it now. If you if you climbed a tree and ate fruit, you'd be sectioned. People would think you were balmy. But I think you know that's certainly as a kid, it's legitimate. Um, but. Can I can I add something else too that we were talking about before? We said that we had left for the last uh, three weeks the subject of the pandemic aside because we had other things, important things to discuss. Now, I have got in touch with uh, Kevin, so we might be able to talk this week. But would you like us to, to talk about it today, or should we leave it with questions for, for Friday for a more specific? Uh, oh, I, I don't mind, whatever anybody wants. But um, with, with Kevin, I kind of like the idea of exploring more, you know, the deep subjects um, and trying, you know, the. I, I just don't think we get a lot of bang for the buck if we go to eco health and all that. I say, like, yeah, we know they're conspiracies. <laughs> so what? I'll tell you the Rockefeller Institute. It's just conspiracies wall to wall. It's like there's no profit in discussing it, really. It's just once people, the only profit in discussing it is to explain to liberals that the conspiracies left and right. It's just wall to wall. But okay. apart from that, you know, you, you get into the kind of doomaturd stirring that goes on in the you know in the doomosphere. Um, and you, you think like, okay, so we know they're all these guys, now what? And he's like, well, we're just endlessly exposing them and tracking them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there's not a lot of profit in this exercise. I thought we were making good headway when we started talking about God and all these deep subjects. And then I thought it was interesting, didn't you? I thought it was very interesting the way both of you, um, both of you handled it uh, as spectators and auditors, because we were not really participating but watching the two of you um going into that subject the way you went into it but on both sides was extremely interesting yeah i think i think it's an interesting exercise some people have uh, been upset I, I got a few dms and stuff and so what are you doing dealing with the stupid right wing ass and you know all this kind of stuff and i tried to explain to them that you know everybody everybody's uh, talks about unity and you know they're like there we are just talking about Derek Jensen and and Leah Keith and Deep Green Resistance and oh we've got to build a big movement but we got to fucking kill the fascists if they come through the door <laughs> it's like well how big is this movement gonna get <laughs> it's like everybody says we've got to be unified and oh we can all agree that we've got to be unified but then no one will talk to anybody on the other side. They just blah, rage quit and leave the room and say, well, what happened to all this unity? Well, it so, would be interesting to see what he has to say about cults. Yeah, and it's what we think of cults, like you know. Yeah, it's one of those uh, bad things about the left they gatekeep. It's like you know, if you can get the right wing on board with, you know, taking down the monetary system, like we can gatekeep or fight about other things later. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, it's really makes me despair because they, you know, they talk about tolerance and hate speech. And it's like, dudes, if you're looking for hate speech and intolerance, it's all on the left. <laughs> you know, it's, come on, guys. Pot me kettle. It's ridiculous. It's ironic, isn't it? But it's just flipped completely now, or it's flipping in the process of the left. They're just becoming the authoritarians. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I'm, I'm feeling that strongly, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you know, all my South African neurons are busy triggering, I'm getting flashbacks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, 
uh, all the older generations, it's the same in the UK. I think there's a lot of people who have emigrated from Eastern Europe who are saying, this is not looking good. <laughs> in terms yeah, it's, it's, of it's Cold War. It's Cold War. I, I, I've thought for, for ages that we've been bullshitting ourselves about China and saying that, oh, you know, the communism and ended in the Soviet Union. That was the end of communism. All went away. It's like, no, the, the Chinese are just very very clever and long range, long, um, you know, long sided communists. They never left communism, not, not even slightly. They just adopting capitalism so that they basically can get hegemony. Once they've got hegemony, they're going to basically apply communism. This is a long game for communism. But it, all economists and that are saying, oh, well, it's, you know, it's not ca ca communism in China anymore. It's state capitalism. And oh, yeah, right. It, basically, everybody. Everybody turned into a capitalist in the end. Bullshit. They're using capitalism or, you know, a weird sort of state capitalism to basically get the power to do global communism. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, uh... um, just to say quickly before we go on, yeah, what we were... What we were discussing in relation to the pandemic wasn't so much on the conspiracy side. It was actually more to do with the science and just to get Kevin's opinion, because I think he mentioned um, that guy, the Professor Bert um, van den Bosch. Um, it was quite interesting. So it was more of a kind of, it's looking, yeah. I think like you said with the, how narrow the vaccine is on, uh, in relation to the spike protein, it's looking like that is going to be bad news because it's probably going to drive immune escape. Um, so we were just wondering if, um, yeah, if Kevin comes back on just to get his latest um, scientific look at that. that hey, this guy, Gert van den Bosch, he's a veterinologist, I think, a veterinarian, but he's got a PhD in virology. Um, he's been quite outspoken within, but all, all, and it's all proper science, it all makes sense, and people that agree with him, obviously they can't speak because then they'll lose their jobs. But um, yeah, he, he did an interview with Brett Weinstein on the Dark Horse podcast, which was very, very good for the layman um, in respect of understanding his thesis on where he thinks this is going. And it's looking like it's going to end up with young people, all of us being in the crosshairs. Um, so yeah, because it's, it, it's never been the case before that we've had a mass vaccination program at the same time as a pen, in the midst of a pandemic which is kind of, in his eyes, is really bad news. Um, yeah, it could mean yeah that a lot of people get... I think uh, this is very important, what you're saying, yeah. Tom, because that is at the centre of the, the, the ev what everybody who has a bit of sense is saying, vaccinating during a pandemic has never been done and is totally absurd. And, and Kevin hasn't... Has, he's touched a subject in one of the streams that I kind of tried to watch for so long to to get to <laughs> with him, but he did. But it would be interesting to, if you were there, to keep that question for him. I think because that's a very important thing. It, very important. Yeah, it's like a crash course in um, in biology and trying to understand was really complex. But this is the thing: the whole thing is such a complex um, scientific issue, um, and everybody's trying to be a a layman a biologist and trying to understand it but this interview yeah that he did was really good because they broke it right down for everybody who's just got this simplistic logic about it it's like no this isn't going to solve it this is actually probably going to make it worse and it's going to kill our innate immunity um so lockdowns really were the worst possible uh yeah uh, solution um they've just as again you know we've gone and created we've intervened as humans and we yeah we're our own worst enemy it seems so yeah well yeah this is this is my entire shtick is uh it's the management of things that screws it up is is yeah. that it's it so it's very complex all the thing is complex like you say it's it's virologists don't understand immune systems immunologists don't understand immune systems they don't, don't understand even begin to understand them they know a lot but they you know compared to what you know the complexity of the subject is they know nothing so everybody's an everybody's an amateur in this this field and so the, the rule is you can't manage it for that very reason is complexity is best managed by leaving it alone and that's that's the one thing that we can't do because we have this control narrative but the dangerous guys 
yeah, this is my theme over and over again, is the most dangerous people in these situations, from a desert island to a pandemic to collapse, is the guys that keep law and order and want to do control. And the, the, the worst thing is that people love it. If you get into those situations, some psychopathic, narcissistic dickhead steps forward and says, well, we better get some order here. And there are a dozen other people that go, well, at least somebody's taking charge. This is awesome. Lord of the yeah. flies. Lord of the flies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but the yeah, Lord of the Flies is not good psychology. It was uh, they've they've proved that those in those situations that's not how people behave. So the, there was a, um, a, a a Lord of the Flies situation, a genuine one, where these kids were actually dropped on an island. I think they were New Zealanders, and they behaved exactly like Rebecca Solnit said. They they set up uh, fires and put watches. They they helped each other. I think I think there was one of them that was injured. They basically saved the guy's life. They 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 were complete Boy Scouts. They were absolutely immaculate. But <coughs> so I think William Golding. That I don't think anarchists like that book because it's it's Hobbesian and it's saying when <laughs> when you don't have you know adults, all the kids go to shit. And if you remember how the book ends, it's when you know the sailors come back, the officers and stuff, and civilization comes back, then it restores order. And it's actually the, exactly the other way around in real life. Is, is those guys on the ship and doing that kind of management. If they were on the island, all the civilized guys, it would have been, you know, Nazism and everything that happened on as as according to William Golding's conception. So William Golding is a, is a bastard because he, he sold this narrative that's, that's, that is our prevailing narrative, that it all goes to shit, it goes Mad Max as soon as you lose control. And there's this so, such a bad narrative because we're going into the situation where people are going to basically champion these guys. They, as things go to shit, they champion all these authoritarians that make things worse and worse. I mean, I still see these guys today saying, well, you know, what the pandemic shows us is how when the world pulls together, what we can achieve as human beings. And you're like, what are you fuck are you talking about? It's been a disaster from end to end. Why what you what do you, what do you, what do you I, I honestly can't wait until because in the UK at the minute they everybody is blowing smoke up their ass about how we're the best and after Brexit, look at us, we invented this amazing new vaccine and everywhere we've got the highest vaccination rate bar Israel in the world and everything's gonna be fine now. And it's like please, I just I almost, I, it sounds macabre, but I am almost willing it on because it's just playing into the hands, as you say, of all these fucking idiots like Matt Hancock, complete sociopath, um, Johnson. I mean, even Johnson, although I will say you can tell actually by reading them that clearly they are worried that now because of the, the, the variants and because of what's happening in India, that they do know something more because they're saying, oh, no, we must be cautious, you know, on when we're opening up, like, you know, and everyone got confused and said, well, hang on a minute, we've got really high vaccination rates. Aren't we, aren't we due our freedom now? And they're like, no, no, you must be cautious. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, the way I kind of see it is each one of these variants is a new pandemic. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's like if... If India was raging like it is now, it is, if you say the vaccines are, don't actually stop the P1, uh, uh, whatever the the other the the, the, the Shamira that's in India, or the two, mm. the two melded together. I think it's the South African one and the, the Brazilian P1, and that you know the, they're saying now, okay, the vaccines are useless against it now. If that's the case, that's a new pandemic. So if India was being ravaged by a pandemic, and this was January 2020, the whole world would be running with its hair on fire. But instead, they were like, oh, that's the end of the pandemic. No, I think this is the start of the pandemic, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Europe, Europe is in la-la land. Every country of Europe is in la-la land. I, 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 I scan through the, the headlines of Germany, Greece, France, Italy. It's just the same thing everywhere. Yeah, they, they opened up the 
the place I'm in here to tourists. And they're all bloody COVID monsters running around without, none of them have masks on. So I went for my usual walk. I thought like, bloody hell, I'm getting out of here. It's very crowds of people without masks on. I'm like, Christ, I, I can't wait to sail out of here. It's getting, getting a bit... <laughs> But, but it's crazy. The, the cases are going up sharply in Greece. And they, yeah. they're opening, as they go up, they're opening it up for tourism. It's, Who's coming in there, then? Which countries are coming no, in? Local, no, local Greek tourists. Oh, I see. Right, yeah. I was going to say, yeah. People, people they are getting COVID fatigue and lockdown fatigue. And so they, 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 they're really antsy. You can feel it. And, and people want any excuse to... To just, I, I went swimming today, but you're not actually allowed to go swimming. You know, I, I luckily I've got a kind of private beach here, but the, it's actually illegal. You can get fined three grand for swimming. So, but uh, yeah, but in the in the meantime, they they slowly, you know, opening up stuff, and uh, they you can see what they're doing. They're just gauging the deaths. It's basically, you know, how much death can we take for the economy? It's 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 atrocious. You can just see their mindset is that the you can see, I mean you can see dollar for dollar exactly how important uh, a human life is for um, for these psychopaths because they they gauging it. Oh yeah, no no we we're having about a D day invasion per day in terms of deaths. But anyway, it's manageable. At least you know look at the revenue coming in. We will get a bit of tourist dollars tax and it's like wow i can't believe you guys are doing this and the public doesn't mind yeah look at that yeah, yeah the, is that the uh, stock market yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah the um the, the yeah the yeah. thing with the covid they're doing exactly what they thought i would or they're doing uh, what i thought they would do with covid and this normalize the deaths as business as usual yeah so it's really, it's really to. sickening. They have to, but yeah. Yeah, because we every day on the BBC, there's like a, it's like a bloody weather forecast. I just, it's it just constant, and it's like, oh, within 28 days, there's been this many COVID deaths, and of course now it's right down low. Um, but yeah, it's it's just meaningless after a while. People zone out and just like every day that I mean, I don't watch the news anymore, but whenever I hear it on the radio or something, it's like. And today, you know, this many deaths and this many cases, and I think it's. Uh, I think. Bamboo. Guy... Oh, sorry. I don't... Go on. No, no, go on. No. I, I think these guys need to watch it because what they're doing in their com extreme incompetence in terms of psychology is very close to what you do to prisoners um, under interrogation. So one of one of the things that you do is um, uh, with a prisoner under interrogation is oscillate them to extremes. See, a great way to crack somebody under interrogation is is to let them think they've been released and then rearrest them. That's a very old technique, and a lot of a lot of people that they've got a like. There was one master guy I can't remember his name. A master. Um, Spy, spy catcher in World War Two, and and he he caught one of the best uh, German spies, I think, and that's that's the way he did it. He he said to him, you know, like, yeah, okay, well, you know, uh, we're done. You we can't find anything wrong, and um, so okay, uh, you're free to go. And it was only when the guy got up that he suddenly realized he had said, "You're free to go" in German. And that was it. He cracked. So the the it, it, see what I'm trying to say is they're doing that to uh, to the British population by saying it's all over, yay, and everything. They say, oh, it's all back. Yeah. In terms of psychology, they'll break them. They're traumatizing them. You mm -hmm. you'd be better off, uh, you know, if, if you think of them like troops in a in a foxhole. You'd be very care careful as a commander to say, "Yeah, it's all over. The battle's won. Hooray! You can all jump out." Of you. you you'd be very careful if you knew the battle wasn't over to not raise people's hopes, because raising them and dashing them is like breaking them, like a you know, like a paperclip. You're folding backwards and forwards.
But but the result of breaking them, which is happening in front of our eyes, I mean, I see people literally being broken. I mean, and that technique is absolutely applied. I'd like to, it would be interesting to 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 discuss the result of this. In, in in I mean I don't know about the United States but in Europe because I don't know how the situation is for you over there Mike and others there because it, it seems like your lockdowns are a bit different to 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 to, to what we have and the vaccinations is is all a bit it's all a bit different but uh, what what is the I mean it's uh, it's pretty similar they're they're just yeah. mass vaccinating everyone and slowly reopening things um, there's shops that are open now i think they're starting to open up i will in my area uh, people are having brunch um trying to have more people in in the restaurants now so yeah it, it, i think it's the same trajectory as europe are they having um are they allowed to eat indoors or just out of yeah doors? i think in the uk yeah, they eat out of doors right oh really, really? yeah um, in the, UK at the minute it's just all it's real gradual but yeah it's outdoors yeah um in my state uh around town i see everyone eating indoors in restaurants yeah yeah and children are going back to live classes um and the bus capacity has been increased before it was um during the start or the middle of the pandemic it was like 10 people, 20 people. Now it's supposed to be, I think, 25 people on the bus, and that's not enough space. And also, there was uh, this thing that they said before it was keep six feet distance apart. Now they say three feet is acceptable. Yeah, they did that in the first uh, lockdown, didn't they? They changed the distances. <laughs> But it's I, airborne. Uh, you're... Exactly, yeah. And the thing I find most shocking, though, I think, is the way that um, you can see how the behavioral psychology has worked on people because how it was in the beginning, it was like, you know, we know that young people aren't that's really that affected at all. They, they were the people that were supposed to build the herd immunity, um, build the barrier, you know. But of course, because of lockdown, you know less people have been exposed to it and now it's flipped and it's like everyone needs to be vaccinated and so all these young people i mean everyone's going to end up with you know fucked. Yeah, <laughs> like that's why people were doing the right thing when they were breaking the law and having those gatherings and everything okay there could have been some infecting their grannies and some of them might get it but they were doing instinctively the right thing yeah and they were cracking down on them because they were having big raves and they were, you know, it's just, I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was just like listening to some of the, the, these theories about, you know, how if you would just left everything, you know, like in the first, in the flu, the 19th, the Spanish flu, you know, that was done in a year. And, and, and there was, there must have been variants then. Um, uh, no, there were there were a number of waves. So there were three waves in the nineteen eighteen. So, so th there's stuff definitely that you don't want to do, but it's easy. It's you just stop movement. You see what happened in nineteen eighteen? They realize now that it was transported by the army, and they kept on you know mobilizing for World War One and shifting all these these soldiers around to barracks. And they realize now that they were circulating the virus. They should have basically just stopped the movements of these mm -hmm. these things. But um, yeah, the 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 fact that they are allowing planes to fly now is just balmy. It's just and just what I was going to say today. I was a clear day, lovely blue skies. What was I seeing? Planes crossing across the Atlantic there and above me, coming from mainland Europe, going to Canada, America. And like last year during the first lockdown, the skies were completely empty. They stopped the flying, but there it's just going like normal. So they're organizing quarantines and. People have to do this and the, 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 but it's the plays are tra and and the staff and the the, so, movement, the movement is the is continuous continuous. Yeah, so so I, these guys were having over here we're, ha, we're having a lunch today and they there is three couples that have been flying. They flew one flew to Israel, one flew to Spain, one flew to France. Um, and then they were discussing, they're saying, oh, well, it's quite safe on the plane. 
um, because they have HEPA filters and the filters and stuff, and saying like that's horseshit. If you have a look at this plane that arrived in Hong Kong with 49 infections on it, you have a look at the seating arrangement. It's freaking obvious what happened. There's one guy in the back had it, and basically there's a big circle around him of all the people he infected. So, you know, HEPA filter is great, but it's at the back of the plane. In the meantime, there's a lot of air circulating around. <laughs> it's like to, to put people in a tube and think oh, some HEPA filter at the back of the plane is going to help you is like cuckoo. It's just balmy. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just you just have to have flight service, and, you know, that, that'll spread it around the cabin. And so it's it's... It's not the way that I think the best way to think of it is like an aerosol. So mm -hmm. if you can smell something like perfume or something, I, mm -hmm. I think that is has about the same nanostructure in terms of about six microns or something as as a perfume. So if you can smell a perfume through a plane, that's it. You are smelling <laughs> your dose of COVID. But I mean, just think about it. If somebody on the front of the plane had a strong, you know, odor cologne. And you say, oh, that's all going to be sucked into the HEPA filter and you're not going to smell it? Of course not. You're going to smell it all over the freaking plane. I mean, just use, use your noggin. Yeah, because they're recirculating the air inside the plane because they used to, when people were smoking a long time ago on flights, there used to be a form of air conditioning where the air was pushed outside so that the smoke wouldn't. But now, now that smoking is gone, they've stopped this system. So in fact, it's recirculating. <laughs> so. It cost the, it cost them money. They were they used yeah. to take in fresh air, and it, it it cost them you know like one percent of the fuel budget. I mean, so now they 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 stopped it in in the eighties, and then they just from then on they recirculated air. And everybody said they they showed there lots of studies back at that time that said this was not a, a good thing to do, especially on a like a thirteen hour flight. It's basically that air is recirculated many mm. many times in the cabin and the HEPA filter doesn't do diddly squat if you've seen how they maintain things on an aircraft and when they actually replace HEPA filters it's like bullshit you I bet you half the fleet you'd find they probably left the HEPA filter out but they they uh, the, the airlines extremely negligent you 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 mm. really shouldn't trust the you know any kind of tech on them but the but the the thing is that in the day when they t started recirculating, uh, the study said that this is basically a disease vector. And I think people also said it's going to cause pandemic one day. And so, you know, the fact that they just kind of swept all that under the rug means that they're criminals. They should all be in front of the Hague. But like nobody's going to the Hague anymore. It's like, you know, criminal behavior has been normalized. Lack of leadership has been normalized. And so, you know, anybody I think can do anything. You know, now we don't even go after, you know, Pooh Bear for uh, what is obvious illegal weapons research. <laughs> but anyway, on the illegal weapons research, it's it's gaining ground now. Basically, <laughs> more and more, it's getting harder and harder now. More and more things are coming yeah. out. That's exactly what um, Hurt Van den Bosch was saying, and and uh, Brett Weinstein. They were saying exactly that because it, it it wouldn't if it had come from just the natural environment, it wouldn't have um, mutated as quickly as that. I I think that's right. There, there's something that proves that it the the way the rapid the rapidity of the variants is a proof. I, I believe I'm right in saying that. I might you know, fact check me, but there was a reason, and I think that was what it was, that these, we've had such a, a you know, a quick um, transition into, you know, different strains and mutants. There always will be, but but it's been very rapid how quickly, and they, they don't think that it would have, um, they were actually referring to the 1918 pandemic um, in respect of, of the differences between uh, sars cov Two or COVID nineteen and and that and the Spanish flu and how this one seems to be yeah there's more evidence that it came from a lab. <clears throat> yeah, the, so, but I mean, the the CCP's behaviour is just so damn guilty. I mean, it, if mm -hmm. if it, so so at the very least the CCP thinks it came from from the Wuhan lab. I mean, even if it didn't, the you know the fact that they think it did is enough for me. So I mean. 
it's it's unbelievable why this isn't the biggest scandal in the world because they haven't released the first 40 patients records and i mean that's just basic basic stuff i mean there's there's i can't think of a reason why you wouldn't release the record of the first 40 patients unless they were in the Wuhan lab and so i mean i mean all their their behavior down the line is guilty they removed all the the Xi Jinglis, the Batwoman's um, database, all all the things, the 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 Rat G thing, um, you know, which was proven to be uh, 1913 virus collected uh, by by the PLA, by the army. So mm -hmm. it's basically they said they found they caught them red-handed, basically sticking the the you know that exact <laughs> virus into the database in in 2020. When when it was really captured, so so what happens in the intervening years? Obviously, they're doing. You know, well, so I asked ask so. a candid question: What would be the consequences of China admitting that um, it was a bioweapon that was accidentally released from their lab? I I, th I think what would, be, the, what would happen? The, I, well, I think that's one of the reasons why nobody's doing anything because nobody knows. You you'd be at an impasse. You see, the, everybody signed the treaties for bioweapons research, and it's it's banned. But everybody's guilty up the yin yang. In fact, Britain and America are the most guilty of anybody. The French were working in Wuhan. Yeah. So, so if you if you look at Fauci and Peter Dazak and all those guys, they funneled money. They were working on bioweapons research with the Wuhan lab. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's written all over it. That's so, the BBC reported that. In the in the first lockdown on Newsnight, Mark Urban was there telling Emily that it was highly likely that it came from that lab. And the Centers for Disease Control was right next to that Wuhan lab, and the Americans were there, as you say, they were there, yeah, looking. They, at they, they got money from the One Health Alliance. They, they got yeah. one one. The, 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 the I think NIST or the NIH gave. Um, Eco Health Alliance. They gave them 1.7 million, and part of that money was given to the Wuhan lab to do research into coronaviruses and bats. Mm. So it's it's like, hello, <laughs> you know. So it, I mean, it's it's clear that all the governments know that that's yeah. that's the case. Now, it's it's what happens after that is politics. Mm. So it's it, they just. Uh, you know, it's not a question of oh, you naughty boy. Now you got to go to the Hague. It's um, you know, basically no one's going to the Hague for it. It's just political uh, bargaining chips and stuff like that. But you see, like, what are you going to do with that information? I mean, imagine, imagine you buy you Like, now what? You know, what, so it's it's out. You you know now what what do you do? All you're going to do is wreck the economy, bring us closer to war, and you know. And it's just, I mean, whether or not it's deliberate, I mean, it surely is, it's probably somewhere in the middle, isn't it? It's, it's convenient for some people, um, let's just say, I suppose, but, but it's highly likely that if you go tickling the dragon or whatever, you know, what metaphor you want to use, it, you know, at some point it's going to get, you know, there's going to be an accidental leak, isn't there? Or someone's going to get infected by it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that some <laughs> evil guys <laughs> that went and you know deliberately released it like twelve monkeys or something, you know. Yeah, I, it doesn't have that kind of smell to me. It smells yeah. like they were tickling the tail of the dragon, and of course, I mean, it looks like SARS, you know, one COVID yeah. one was was a leak, and so so you see, this is what makes these psychopaths that rule us in just so damn bad. Is, is really, if China said, okay, it was, uh, you know, illegal weapons research, uh, it was us, uh, th then the only victim would be all the virologists doing this kind of research. Basically, the obvious thing that would happen would be there would be this huge outcry in the world, and they would stop that kind of research, gain-of-function research and bioweapons research, and that would be great for everybody. So the fact that they don't go there means that they want to carry on doing their bioweapons research. So these guys are bastards of, you know, why aren't journalists calling these guys out saying, you bastards 
are not calling China out because you want to carry on doing the same kind of research in, you know, in your own laboratories in Portland Down and stuff like that in the UK. That's why you're not calling it out, you heinous criminals. And we don't real journalists anymore. <laughs> There's none left, is there? Oh, I forgot that bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there are a bunch of charlatans that serve power, yep. <laughs> Yeah, science doesn't seem to have, um, well, you know, I know ethics is probably subjective, but um, I don't know, morality, it's just, um, it's just um, they're all power, glory, money. Yeah, they're all consequentialists. They all think in terms of, you know, the great game and, what you know, they're all just playing chess with us. And so, you know, they... They're not thinking in terms of common or garden primate brain morality. They're thinking in terms of a, a giant chess game. And so, you know, this chess game has to stop because it, it is fundamentally a zero-sum game. So they're playing a zero-sum game with with humanity. And, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I wish I could just pull everybody instantly out of there. The par partisan party politics, the identity politics, and all of this kind of stuff. Because the, the you know we are getting towards you know Derek Jensen's end game, and, and it's it's this is it. This is we're getting close to Armageddon, and we're going into Armageddon about the worst way you want to go in. We're going in stupid. We're going in divided. We're going in clueless, uninformed. Um, it's just I I I couldn't despair more about where people are at. Well, talking about despair, I was um, talking to Mike and Tom before we came on about the fact that I was put a bit under pressure by friends, family, to watch a documentary called Sea Spiracy. It's on Netflix, which is kind of, you know, already rises at one eyebrow for me. And uh, so I went through it. And of course, it was about the sea, so it was close to my heart. And uh, if people have seen it, I don't know if any of you have seen it apart from Mike, but it's, um, it's, an, in it's an inquiry into uh, first plastics and then uh, the involvement of, of uh, charities and various environmental organizations to camouflage the fact that the fisheries are, uh, are dumping much more uh, nets and stuff than the actual plastic that you're using with your straws. And it also touches on the dolphins, on the on the collateral damage of the big nets, and all sorts of things. And it talks about sea shepherds and okay, but at the end of that, you have to watch it maybe if you if you want to know what I'm talking about. But I got a very bad feeling about this um, documentary, which was doing the usual ingredients of truths that were administered at the right posology with a little tugs towards, uh, uh, you know, uh, don't eat fish anymore, um, um, you know, donate to charities who are doing something, you know, disempowering type of um, talk, discourse. Um, I, I have very, and I, I think it has had a very big audience. So um, hmm, you talk about, you talk about, uh, you talk about intoxication and, and propaganda. Well, watch that one. Even I, though I, 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 um, I didn't see the actual thing, but I saw all the reviews and all the fallout on Extinction Rebellion and collapse about it. So I saw all the counter, the hit jobs and that on it. But um, I, I, I definitely got the, the same impression you did, that it, it's trying to, the oldest trick in the book, that these guys figured all the way from smoking the uh, um, uh, bat and uh, Philip Morris and those uh, those tobacco companies they they figured out this tactic and the the tactic I think maybe this actually also came from Eddie Bernays but the tactic is to make people feel personally responsible and then you you deflect uh, corporate responsibility. The, that's what the the straws and the plastics and uh, you know these uh, coke and stuff organizes beach cleanups and stuff because they they want people to feel guilty and do their own cleanup uh, because then uh, they were very but they were very clever because 
they went to the companies who are fighting plastic pollution and they tried to say, you know, we're doing really, we're going in depth. They don't want to talk to us because we're questioning the the, the fisheries, we're questioning the big trawlers and, you know, the well, sea shepherd that's ramming boats and sinking them and they're heroes and that you are the bad ones. And But in fact, at the end of the, at the end, as I was telling the lads earlier, the advice was stop eating fish, <laughs> like, you know, and yeah um that's the thing um that's the thing with uh stuff like that is they can take like a fact or some truths and they can use it to misdirect you it's just like um when i was a kid i was like 16 or 17 or whatever i watched this documentary called earthlings have you guys heard of that one yeah so i watched that and at the end the conclusion was be vegetarian the conclusion should be crashing the economy not you know being vegetarian <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a great diversionary technique. Yeah, but unfortunately, it has a huge audience, and this has a huge impact, because I've talked to young people in Ireland who've watched it, and there's loads of people who have stopped eating fish. And I'm like, guys, you know. So, so what, what, what's so incredibly stupid about all this is, uh, is the economics. So if, you know, all the guys that see it are people that have Netflix subscriptions. So basically, they metrosexuals in, uh, you know, liberal democracies. So all that happens if you stop eating fish is the price of fish comes down and everybody in Africa and India and everybody else starts eating it. So, so you're not saving a single fish. In fact, you're probably uh, making it worse because at, at least the fishing industries you know, most fishing is unregulated. I, I think at least half of it is, is illegal. So, but at least half of it is being regulated by, at least in a token measure, by I&J and a few, a few food companies. But, but if it all goes to, you know, Korean, Russian, Chinese fleets and North Korean fleets, it's basically, they will decimate it to the last mollusk. So those those Russian uh, those Russian trawlers they they trawl the most sensitive areas in the in in the Indian Ocean and and they they protect it. But I mean, you'd need a warship to protect uh, those things off Madagascar. <coughs> and those guys are fishing them out just as fast as they can. They can fish, actually fish them out faster, and they will if people in the in the you know if you it's kind of like a, a ban on drugs. You're driving it underground, so it's, it's, it's basically you. You have to go after the fisheries, and, sh and well, you have to go after the economy, like you say. But but you you can't do like a war on eating fish because you don't you won't cut down fish consumption even close. You just make it seedy and underground, unregulated and rampant. Yeah, it's like in the, the capitalist economy, all these uh, operations are like uh, power nodes and the money is the energy. So, you know, cut that cut that power there and then the, the operation will cease. Um, but there, there was little messages in it too. There was that um, woman who was an elderly woman who had been a, an activist, a protective of the ocean, a diver, a, a marine biologist, very interesting woman. But she had, the, in her interview, uh, they asked her, are you eating fish now? And she says, no, I've stopped. I haven't eaten fish for years and I'm not eating meat either. Like, oh, God. Do you know, the, the little messages that were sent out, exactly what you said about earthlings, exactly what, you know, making people feel that individual is the solution and individual and individual and you're bad. So I went to check because there was a big, a lot of people from Sea Shepherd and I like those guys, like, because they're active, they're doing something. At least they're on boats and they're, they're doing some, you know, doing a bit of, yeah, activism. But so I look, I went to look at their website. And since the, since the documentary has been on Netflix, they have completely um, inundated their, their website and shop with T-shirts and everything with Sea Spiracy, you know, because they're profiting from the, the big, publicity that they got in the in the documentary for selling their stuff now fundraising and stuff like that so it's all again a big i just the where to where to turn do you know <laughs> well the way to turn the only way i know is to try beat them at their own game and their their own game is is what we're doing now and that's trying to get um get a a, a narrative so 
So here's the thing. It's not a hopeless situation at all because it's whoever has the most compelling narrative. So they have a, they don't have a lot of leeway for a narrative and they don't have a very appealing narrative. What their their narrative is this kind of insipid personal responsibility, bit of austerity, be a vegan, cut down and stuff like that. It's it's a bit of a uh, um, it's a bit Puritan and it's a bit starchy and, uh, you know, kind of unpopular with a lot of people that are not prepared to say so. So you can get a lot of, you know, a lot of noise around that message, but you haven't really got hearts and minds with it. So so what I, what I would, the picture I would paint is imagine the gut-wrenching thing of something like Pizzagate or, you know, save the children or something is is it would sweep that aside so that you can't imagine see spiracy going viral because it's so in, enforced and it's so top down but uh you see a narrative doesn't have to be true in fact it's all, almost better the more outlandish it is in some ways the better it is uh, part of the reason is because it makes a big divide between the inside and the outside group and that's very important in terms of uh, cult identity. So, oh, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just heard a brainwave. I was just thinking about, you just saying about that then, about the more outlandish it is. Do you remember in the lead up to the millennium, how there was all these TV programs about the millennium bug and about, but also there was a lot of disaster uh, scenarios, like there was going to be a huge landslide off of the islands off of Spain and it was going to create a tsunami that would wipe out the whole of the east coast of America and there was going to be well. you know, all of those kind of things. Well, what about your <laughs> one of your book? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty outlandish. I mean... Yeah, that's what it's for. Yeah, so I mean, why don't we just start making that a bit more known? I don't know, like people... Yeah, that, that's what we're doing. Like that's what we're yeah. doing. This, yeah, is, this it, is what this meeting is for. Is to to... Yeah, it's yeah. like start behaving or Mother Nature's going to flip you off, literally. <laughs> yeah, but, but you see, well, actually, you've got to keep some mystique about it, right? So you have, so the, the most powerful thing is is a secret. <laughs> I've really given the game away here, haven't I? But the most, the most powerful thing is a bit of secret knowledge. Then everybody else, there's even bigger divide because it, it allows you to you know the insiders to look down on the other side like clueless idiots if you everybody loves feeling superior and having a bit of secret knowledge about where this actually ends up because it's uh, you know if it, it's very it's a big downer if you know we're heading towards collapse but nobody else sees it and you're like oh god i can't stand these hopeful conversations about you know where the world is headed when you can see that it's going to collapse well it's very lonely mm. and depressing but think of the opposite. You've got you you know like a spaceship is coming down to pick everybody up, and they are all these clueless idiots. <laughs> they don't know that, and they're not invited. And you you know that that's um, that's very very powerful. It's 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 the effect of it, like a, a exclusivity. Cult. Cult. <laughs> what? Cult. Yeah, this I'm talking cult. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking cult cult one one. Yeah. 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 No, I'm talking kind of, so the, so the aim is 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 to have uh, you know exclusivity and um, uh, and rarity of, of very big ploys in terms of marketing products and stuff is is that's one of the things is 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 like a nightclub where you have an exclusive <laughs> cordoned area uh, most people would chew the right arm to get or you know that kind of status it goes straight to the primate brain and so so the you know a bit of secret knowledge is is great so it's it's you don't want to run around uh evangelizing what i got in my book you keep keep it you know kind of obscure and yeah, yeah but but you you know you kind of nudge nudge wink wink when you know like if you only knew <laughs> is, is a good a good thing but yeah i mean uh my, my intention is as as we go along with this is to bury it deeper and deeper so that you know, if if uh, if this if the arg does actually start to get traction and take off, you you would you would hide it more and more. And it's it's hard. Imagine if you're a journalist and you're trying to make head or tail of what's going on here. You can't 
uh, go too far into the backstory. I mean, this, you know, if, if it took a year or two to take off, it's very unlikely that a journalist would find what I'm saying now and go, you bastard fraud. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you people, and you see, what they're working with is a narrow time horizon. So, so ultimately, what you're beating them on is is uh, time and attention. So, 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 a lot of the stuff that I do, I bury in a mound of fud. So you take a long time to say shit and stuff, and then you're beating people on time. They they can't spend that amount of time. So, example, we might trigger some keywords when we on on this video alone because we mentioned the dreaded subject. Now. You can use AI to surface that. They can basically use voice rec recognition and they can surface a few trigger words. That it doesn't matter a, a damn. They still have to elevate you. And at some stage, there's the human element. Somebody has to be tasked with going and assessing this for risk. Mm. At that point, they snowed because the guys are time bound and we're not. So we're on Kairos. I mean, we're on, you know, on Kairos going opportunistically and they're on chronos they have a time slot so if any a human agent was was assigned to actually assess the serious institute and that they would be given like find out what these guys are and you know these go a few hours to do it hmm. you don't even scratch the surface of it. Yeah. and then then you know they, so so you you get put in a back burner it takes a long time to get out of that back burner again and back on the radar and so, and then give a deeper assessment. And by the time they actually give you a thorough going over, you, you could just close shop and start a new one. Mm. So the the idea is to wear the wear them down in that way. So that's the uh, that's part of the kind of thinking that if uh, XR did proper strategy, they'd be thinking in terms. You remember how we talked of cost benefit, and yeah. they. If it's not only money, you know, time is money. The cost benefit is also in terms of time. So wasting uh, wasting police resources is a, a felony in most most countries. But you know, like it's a very very gray area <laughs> wasting police. Are. So so really, you you want to uh, wear them down, wear, wear, steal their time from them, and then that that's that's the it's it. You see. If you think in terms of absolute things, if you th think of you go to, to war with an opposing enemy, when you, you know, if you very, if you're a rookie and you go coming into this cold and you think, okay, now I'm going to do battle, and you think, well, I got to like take out the enemy. No, you, you see, if you just, if you actually shot and killed somebody. Then they are, that's an enemy soldier out of the game. But you have to think of it in terms of time and resources, right? Am I, it, it's actually quite quick to bury the guy and replace him. What most insurgent armies find out is that you're better off wounding the, the guy. Then you've got endless amounts of you know helicopter trips and hospital things and doctor staff. And when you add it up, you see, like in, in, in South Africa, they, they try to do a guns and butter war. And that, that means they tried to keep the population sweet. They kept them in the dark about how bad the, the war was and things like that. But to do that, they have to give absolutely capital medical attention. So, uh, you know, one military hospital in South Africa was probably the best military hospital in the world. because They, they had to, to keep it quiet. And so the, uh, so, but the, the net result was if somebody was wounded, say, say, what the the insurgents realized was if you actually kill a guy while well, you have a short funeral and it doesn't it's not a big loss <laughs> if you actually wound a guy it it turned into millions and millions of rand and then rehabilitation and so if you look i have a friend who had both legs and an arm blown off in iraq a, a british squaddy oh yeah yeah i remember you mentioning um, yeah the guy who says yeah yeah, he's he's sailing around South America now. Mm. Now, he the amount of money that the UK government has spent on him is absolutely extraordinary. The yeah. guy, that, the the actual guy that actually blew him up, he was you know sitting in a in a gully um, with a with a cell phone, 
and mm. they got him quickly. A helicopter took him out. So if, to, the loss to the Taliban is Mahmoud mm, probably save a bit of money on rice and they lose a cell phone. The loss mm. to the British government was millions and millions and millions. So, so that the way to do it is is time and material is is to drain the resources. So, in in terms of activism, Exile should be thinking in what's the least trouble to us, and the most trouble uh, to to the establishment. Very often, what you'll find is is it's a story. So, okay, so let's take an example. Imagine you know you this endless stupid idiotic debate about violence and nonviolence, and it's so like, okay. The best tactic of all is like forget violence and nonviolence. It's just find out which is the most cost effective in terms of net benefit. So if you do cost accounting for any tactic, that, that's the way to go. So think of think in terms of this way. Imagine we talked about like LNG carriers. They basically you know they got three big tanks, giant LNG tanks. They basically have enough energy. Each one of them is one atomic bomb. So it's like three atomic bombs on an LNG freighter. And what are they going to do? They're going to park it on the Thames just close to the city. So you know, brilliant. They, they can only get away with that because nobody knows what they're doing <laughs> and they, they're scoundrels. Mm -hmm. So now think about it. You could think, well, you could do like a lone wolf attack against those guys blow one of those things up, a lot of people would die. It would be freaking awful. And you think in terms of cost benefit, it's like, well, it, the cost would be extreme, but the cost would also be extreme to the insurgents that did, did an operation like that. Hmm. Now think how cheap it is if you faked an operation like that. If, hmm. you, if you credibly faked it and then you, you know, make sure that basically there, there was enough stuff to, that you really got the security forces worried, the security forces would hush it up badly because they don't want anybody to know that you're parking atomic bombs down the Thames. So they, so, so it would be hushed up. Now, think how cheap it is to get one conscientious journalist to uncover this story, which actually did happen. It just didn't succeed. But it was designed not to succeed. But we keep that out of the story. Imagine that one journalist on the story. It, it, see, it would, as it surfaced, it would cost so much in terms of distraction from the things. A, so, so the cost of the insurgency is the time of one bastard spinning this yarn, and they could probably make a profit out of it. You, you could write books and make videos, and probably make that a career out of it. Absolutely brilliant. Mm. Yeah. So, brilliant. But just, just see what I mean in terms of, of often the cheapest thing. Mm -hmm. The first thing to think of is, is it's all psychology and controlling the narrative. But you, you see, if you can make a narrative that's hugely expensive for, for the other side, that's really the cheapest to, to, to the side. Okay, think, th okay, I'll give you another example. Think, think what the, the Quebec Anon guys did. Um, with uh, that pizza get. Uh, so that is so cheap. I mean, the cost to them <laughs> was nothing. The cost to the other side was maybe an insurrection. <laughs> it was a, just think of all the time and effort that has come down from that. So, so you, you have to think in terms of those very cheap shots. You, you actually brought, brought that up very early when we met last year about the EMP uh, ideas of mm. toys that could suddenly be... Well, that's, that's another one. It's another one. Is, 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 is if you pretended, it's often better than the thing. Now, of course, at some stage, you, if you get... I mentioned before, and this is... If you've got a reputation for faking it, then you have to go follow through. But, but that's really... It's only when somebody calls you bluff that you actually need, need, uh, need, need to respond. It reminds me... Of the War of the World, uh, was it? No, what was the broadcast with um, also H.G. Wells. Wells? Yeah, also, the War of the World, yeah. Wells, yeah. yeah, and they thought the US population thought it was really happening that you know aliens were coming from outer space. 
<laughs> it's actually on YouTube. Uh, there's the original broadcast, and it's it is absolutely amazing the way he describes it because yeah. there's the orchestra playing and everything, and little by little it builds up, and there's that, the that. over there, and he's telling, I can see the aliens, and they have arrived, and and, and everybody believed him. The population were conditioned to fear the commies were coming, I suppose, or you know, so they were. Everybody was just like, "Oh my God, it's happening! It's happening!" <laughs> uh, so the, there have been various accusations against H.G. Wells. So one of the while he was doing that broadcast, they actually sent in the Fed, and they, he locked himself in the studio so he could complete the broadcast. But there have yeah. been a lot of accusations against H.G. Wells that he did it on purpose as an anarchic. Uh, a, a deliberate anarchic tactic. So it's funny you mention it because I think the chances are pretty good that he knew exactly what he was doing. And it was actually exactly what the FBI thought it was. And it was a propaganda coup. Mm. So the, but it is, it's a great example of, of, you know, okay, so let's think in terms of us now. If you think, what you know of all the things that they're most scared about in uh, you know the, the state is most scared about just just imagine you know of all it's you know you, you go to bed tonight and you think you imagine, imagine you boris johnson or pretty patel you think what you know you, you've got a big workload a lot of shit you know your day is not very pleasant at the moment what would be the worst fucking thing you you know that, that somebody came in and said look i got i got some pretty bad news i don't know if it's serious but blah 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 I think what would that be <laughs> so they think like oh fuck no and then basically you try and make that happen oh, so, dirty bomb uh, sorry should use wrong um <laughs> well, well that's that definitely got a flag right there secret uh, <laughs> but so so yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but so so okay, so so yeah, but you see, it's difficult to HG Wells that. So so the you mean Orson Wells? Yeah, Orson Wells. Oh, HG Wells is War of the Worlds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Orson Wells was Orson Wells <laughs> reading HG Wells. Yeah, so, sorry, I'm mixing up. I mean Orson Wells. So Orson Wells was actually quite a radical, and so I th I think he was actually doing an op on the, but. Um, okay, so so just yeah, okay, um, yeah, okay. So develop it is is like ah, okay. So you t okay, uh, you can weave in some stuff like if you take existing stuff like Fukushima. Mm. So already you've got a basis. So so uh, it's you taking something that is in the back of people's minds and is kind of contentious. So, you know, in Fukushima, the Tepa and stuff, they are hiding the fact that they're actually in real trouble. They're, they, they've run out of space to keep the cooling water. And so, you know, they, they're releasing water into the ocean, Con, you know, radioactive uh, contaminated water because they just can't store any. They, ran, they, they, they have to keep pumping water into that, um, that mm. nuclear core mm. uh, because to cool it because it has they don't know whether it's gone through the casement or not but it's basically it's it's hot for for you know humanity's lifespan and nobody knows what to do with it and uh, they just have to keep on pumping water to it that water is contaminated so they they've been pumping it into big tanks and freezing it uh the they they've had to freeze the water underneath the groundwater so that it can't uh, you know the contaminants can't be in and uh, then they've just been putting the, the, the water that they're using to cool the hot core. They've just been hiding it under the rug in these big tanks. They're running out of physical space to put those tanks. So now they're starting to put them in the water. So it's, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great germ of you, you, you take that and you weave it into the, you know, the DB um, yeah. narrative. So, so um, yes, uh, that that's that's one one idea. The, oh, the the other one is ah yes ah okay. So here's another one that you can also basically put 
put a cat amongst the pigeons, is is um, Syria. Syria just launched a few rockets uh, and narrowly missed Demona, <laughs> which is. Uh, do you know what Demona is? No, I don't. Ah, you see, yeah, this is gorgeous. Um, Israel just retaliated against Syria in the next episode of the Cold War. The um, Syria launched some rockets uh, that were, I think, of, well, Israel claims that some Patriot missiles took it down. Uh, they're lying through their teeth. A Patriot missile can't take, take down a, a kite. But the the uh they've they've got a good narrative in israel telling the israeli population that oh you know you've got an in, indestructible defense shield I've, I've got a oh shit i might dox myself yeah anyway i have a friend an israeli friend in, in the military who spins this horseshit story about this impenetrable shield and we've got way more advanced than the patriot it's it's, it's a bullshit story. They told the same story to people in Moscow that most people during the Cold War who lived in Moscow had this delusion that there was this d defensive bubble over, over Moscow. So it was impenetrable by nuclear weapons. It was when they found out later that it was a complete fabrication, they were, they were amazed. Well, anyway, they tell this bullshit story to Israelis and they all lap it up. So anyway, in comes these missiles this week. <laughs> <laughs> they land just short of Demona. Demona is is Israel's nuclear site. It's okay. their secret nuclear site where they developed all the nuclear weapons with South Africa, and uh, they probably have about twenty nuclear bombs there. So that's a prime thing for actually saying that is Israel hiding the fact that Demona was actually hit by one of these missiles. Then you have pictures of Demona and you superimpose, you doctor them up to say that they basically there was a strike in them and you show satellite things and and then people would you know if you can get any news agency to pick it up then they have to start going like was this hit or not were these photos doctored is this true did it come from wikileaks and all and you can you basically you're playing their propaganda game and the, the real me hidden message you know straight back to the kind of things like seaspiracy is the hidden message is Zionists have atomic bombs, they're destabilizing the Middle East, and they're basically going to uh, cause a, a DB in, in that region. And that's all you want. It's, it's even better than if one of the missiles had hit. The f you see, the fear of them actually hitting is probably worse than if they actually hit. You see, if they actually hit, it's a big disaster and everybody normalizes. If they didn't hit, but everybody's scared that they would, that story is, is, is its own rumor. And that, that rumor is more damaging. If you have a look at uh, psyops uh, of things uh, like in World War II, they, they raided a rumor as, as, as worth a squadron hit of atomic, or not atomic bombs, but a bit of, of conventional, conventional weapons. So basically a mass area bombing, they considered equivalent to a civilian rumor. Uh, could could be equally as damaging, and there uh, is absolutely no parade. To the, I mean, they they can't stop. I mean, that is a thing that's. This is the huge vulnerability. Is they try to stop it? They can do see, nothing about it. We, we, you see, this is why it's such a gem. Because if they try to stop it, that's the worst thing they can do. They fan exactly. the flames. So if you if you look at Kevin, the more stuff he goes into. And the more you see, that's what so, I can't believe they're so stupid as to start censoring people on all why big tech is censoring people because it's such a non goal. Is you, you're just saying, well, there's a big conspiracy, everybody should, and there they're confirming it in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. So now the biggest jerk off liberal that doesn't believe in conspiracy theories now does, and this has only happened in the past few months. Now everybody yeah. knows. Mm -hmm. You say, like, well, the, so, so straight away you've got the worst thing that that can possibly happen to the establishment. And that's a large number of people have suspicion of that the, the authority is actually on their side. That, that, you see, if the majority of the population breaks loyalty with the, with the state, the state is, is uh, in serious, serious trouble. Because if they then start to clamp down, then people can start um, erecting 
a, a war sabotage and then then that is extremely extremely damaging there, there's I, if, if there's a concerted uh, underground war of wrecking and sabotage the global industrial civilization will end quickly it's, but the power the power of rumors is un, un you can't i i've used that myself for personal reasons in the past when i was a teenager and then later in my 30s to get out of certain situations spread a rumor get to know the people who can propagate it who are the ones that are good at it or the networks uh, the power of it's it's unbelievable and i've measured the time it takes to get back to you and everything through the years it's just amazing amazing yeah, but, but you see, all of these, the power that a state has is bluff. The reason mm -hmm. why they're doing surveillance, the primary motivation of surveillance is not to catch people. It's to intimidate people. So the the tactic that I put on for cloaking and stuff like that is the yeah. point of it is, is not really to do operations or anything. It's psychological for the home troops. And it's to show the home troops that it's a paper tiger. You see what you see. The amazing thing. There's almost a rule, I would say, that if something has a grand reputation, it's probably false. And the reason is this: in, in throughout history, if ever there was, you know, like Lord of the Rings, you know, nobody just walks into Mordor kind of thing. It's like everybody knows you can't attack Mordor. Well, the fact that everybody knows you can't attack Mordor means they don't keep up Mordor. Is, is why invest huge amounts of money in something everybody knows is impregnable. So it's probably not impregnable for the very reason that everybody believes it is. And that's a continual thing through, throughout history. And then eventually you do walk into Mordor because basically they didn't invest very hard in Mordor. They invested in all the places where it was contentious. They thought you know, that there, there, um, there was some doubt about their defense. So, so the, if, you, you see, if you can actually hit them in Mordor, they are really seriously fucked because they have uh, this big paper tiger bluff story it, and uh, an insurgency if it can break the bluff in any way it kind of like completely discredits the entire story it's it's almost like a court case you see i've, I've been saying how we're talking symmetry breaking and stuff and i've been saying how uh when things are in actually in in deadlock um the uh, uh you know you you have to break that deadlock. And what people are doing in war is really resolving uncertainty. So really a situation of a battle is really there almost like a court case to resolve uncertainty. The, the world is watching in terms of actually reviewing the court case. So if you, you know, the Battle of Troy, they say all the gods, you know, Zeus went to Mount Ada and watched the Battle of Troy and all the gods came to see. So, so the Battle of Troy is the big Armageddon of its day, and it's to decide the the fates. Um, you know, in terms of you know, it's it's like the battle, the final battle between good and evil. The, the battle you've got to see the Battle of Troy like that. Now the gods are sitting watching that in the. And then, you know, the world looks down on these things. So, you know, the Vietnam War, it's really played, it's really theater for the, the world to watch. And the world is watching like a jury. So well, you need to sway the jury. Now, a jury will be, if you've ever been in a contentious court case, the jury would be swayed by one lie. So, in other words, if you've ever been in a court case, you'll see that, what the two sides are doing is, is in essence, just deciding who gets a black hat and who gets a white hat. Oops. Somebody's look. Oh, so so basically, you you have a court case. You have you know the defendant and the prosecution, and they just deciding who gets the white hat and who gets the black hat. And so as you as you go through cross examination, if anybody's caught lying. That's it. They get the black hat. They will never get that black hat off. It's almost whoever gets the first lie, because if somebody else is, if the guy with a white hat is caught lying, they forgive him. 
in general. It's human psychology. So it's kind of whoever first gets the black hat kind of loses the case. The rest is just formulaic after that. They never believe. If you're caught out in a, a lie, they will never believe anything again. You will never restore that reputation. So that's why the state is extremely vulnerable because they're liars. They're fucking liars to the hilt. They're psychopathic liars. And if you can catch them out in a lie that they can't sidestep, they're done. They'll never recover from that. So they can always, you know, psychopaths are great at backtracking and ducking and diving. But if the psychopaths put up a big idol and say, you'll never get Mordor, or you'll never basically beat our defense strategy, or the U.S. Navy is the best in the world and stuff, and you just say, like, prove it wrong in one instance, and that's it. The whole Navy can go home now <laughs> because yeah. even, the, even the guys in the Navy believe it was a bluff. Yeah, it's like Lord of the Rings is a great example because Aragorn showed up, but his army is like tiny compared to Mordor's, and the Eye of Sauron focused on him, and two fucking hobbits dropped the ring and killed Sauron. <laughs> Boy, well, that's a spoiler. Yeah, damn. <laughs> but you know that that form of strategy would be very interesting to discuss with Derek uh, when we meet him this week because we're going to talk about uh, activism probably and solutions and because the left usually doesn't want to, 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 to look at that sort of and even the right to a certain extent but the, the left certainly does not want to question this 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 way of, of uh, Mordor for example that's that's no we don't go there doesn't want they're, they're very conservative really you know it's actually that way, yeah. you know, if the left has not become more conservative than the right at the moment but in those type of views you know yes and i also it's want to i wanted to relate it to the the gof research that all scientists of probably many many nations are doing um so even if lies are exposed um if the if the journalists don't publicize them or even if they're publicized and we just accept it we just turn our eyes away and we say oh yeah that's progress we want that gof research uh to continue because sci you know science must make progress and you know and it's a necessary uh uh form of defense in our arsenal so people are just gonna turn a blind eye that everybody's doing it and it's got to stop so uh, how, how does that relate to exposing lies or bluffs if people are still accepting of uh the exposed lies oh i oh i see what you mean the, pe the people are jaded so they just they get yes to, uh, they just you know okay we've we've ah, exposed yeah. the bluffs we've exposed the lies and uh yeah okay oh, oh yeah no it's it's okay so it's not that kind of a lie it's it's their foundational myth so so okay uh, you see those kind of lies people expect but it's the lies that are hidden assumptions that people don't even recognize are hidden so for example you know you if you you you, you would it's the kind of lie that is so entrenched in people's thinking that uh, you would you would make people burst out laughing if you said it at a cocktail party. So in other words, if you said at a cocktail party, ah, the US military is fucking useless. It's like, I, I don't give them a three days chance in World War III. Most, most Americans would burst out laughing at a cocktail party at that stage. Oh, yeah, and another one of those, sorry, another one of those lies is the Constitution and how it pretty much enshrines property. It's a, basically a slave document. Yeah, well, but anything, anything, anything like that, that you, you, you know, yes. it's, 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 it's uncontrovertible that no one, it's, it's beyond debate. And you come in like, bang, <laughs> you go like, wait, wait, you can't shoot down that. It wasn't even being contested. And it's like, yeah wasn't being contested and I've just basically everybody assumed it and now it's done. So if, if you can if you can find the foundational myth that that uh, you know everybody assumes. So so one of them is like say the British Empire is it, every 
you know, they the British Empire ran very light. It ran on fumes, in fact. And you know, a tea waller in um, in India or a, a, a provincial administrator in Africa was just normally a pimply kid of twenty two, and he he would be the district commissioner, and he would control essentially Uganda. <laughs> so, you know, actually that would be his district. And he, would, you know, it's just one pimply kid with a revolver holding down a country. And you see, what everybody thought was that, well, you can't say anything against this guy because he represents the queen. And if you do, do, you know, if you did anything to him, you know, the British army would sweep in <laughs> and get you. And it's like, well, no, you know, not really. They're basically, the British Army can't be sweeping in everywhere left and right. There's so so many of these commissioners and so few, you know, soldiers to actually deploy to everybody that's rebellious. So they're relying on the myth that you 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 think there's going to be retribution if you ever touch one of these uh, representatives of the Queen. When guys in Kenya and said like, eh, we don't think this is so. We think if we just nobble this guy in the night, well. Um, nothing's going to happen to us. And they were right. And so, well, they were wrong because the fact that they were right meant that Britain had to chuck everything in to cover it up. But you see, they didn't fully, I don't think the Mama fully understood the game. But if the Mama fully understood the game, they would go to every country in Africa and get them in on it. Or basically they would send a representative of the Maori. And you hear every commissioner in every single district over the whole of Africa, well, that's it. Parliament would dissolve the next day. Because they can't they know that they could you know they'd called their bluff and that swept aside. So so the Mama is not a good example because they could still cover up the bluff by just atrocity. The reason why they were so fierce and they committed such atrocities, torture, just they were, Britain was absolutely brutal in Kenya. And uh, it's all documented. It's all in, in uh, warehouses in Britain and it's all under D notices. They just extended the D notice again 10 years ago for another 50 years because of the heinous crimes that were done, you know, just, just unbelievable stuff. It happened in, it happened in India as well. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and in Ireland. Oh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and great shows the Kenyan. Do you know in, in his recent documentary series? I yeah. think it goes very deep into the Kenyan horrors. Well, yeah, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the Kenyan was, they were so vicious in Kenya be, because um, that was the only way uh, to cover up the bluff that was exposed there. So they, they, they had to go all out. But you see, there, there again, the Mau Mau were not sophisticated or they didn't have enough resources to actually publish that. You see, Britain shouldn't have been able to cover up what they did in Kenya. The, basically, the Mau Mau actually scored a victory if they had managed to get, you know, today, they would have all those atrocities on cell phones and basically people would be marching in Trafalgar Square. They would have been kicked out of Kenya on a nail. But... The so, but it, you know, the point is that uh, the major point I'm making is uh, is find the hidden bluff that that everybody both sides take for granted, and 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 challenge it, even if it's just you know fake challenged. It's um, uh, even if nobody nobody ever thought of it. So so okay, going all the way back to say Demono or something, then you say like. Um, are people dying in Tel Aviv from, um, you know, basically uh, fallout from from a strike that they covered up in Demona? And then, you know, they say, what are the symptoms? Well, they strangely like COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've got a tr kind of trifecta. And it's like, how the hell, the more they say, you know, oh, this is conspiracy, it's not the thing, and basically... You just keep on mining that, and and try and try and string them. The more they fact check and do it, the more they in, inserting this thought in people's mind is, have we really got all nuclear weapons right down the road in Tel Aviv? I don't feel safe. <laughs> they like that's what we're trying to get across to you, <laughs> and it's better than a missile strike. You could get the Israelis to remove those weapons themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. So it's the foundational myth or 
assumptions that everyone take for granted are true when they're not? Yeah, I mean, so, some things, if you lied about, uh, they, they're not a mortal wound. They just kind of like, they can either say, yeah, we, we lie. You know, it's basically Ronald Reagan. He got exposed with the Contras and, you know, de you know CIA dealing drugs for arms. And, and then he says, you know, well, yes, I did lie. Uh, but in my heart, it was true. I lied with my head, but in my heart, it was true. And everybody went, oh, okay, as long as you did it for America. Oh. Like, and so, so, you know, everybody forgives him. If, if he lied, like saying, you know, if he said some something like um, uh, America is go is going to outspend uh, Russia or uh, and then, you know, with with Star Wars or something like that, um, or say they're going into the salt talks, then then you say like, well, we're going into the salt talks, but they're downplaying how m much uh, nuclear capability the Soviets have. It's actually bigger than America. And the reason why we're going into the salt talks is because uh, we've lost the, the Cold War. Now that's fucking dreadful. <laughs> Ronnie Reagan cannot take that as a lie. He can't have that go. So they say, Ronnie Reagan was lying. Actually, the, the, we've lost the Cold War because we just can't keep up with the Soviet, the pace of missiles and the salt, salt talks is not, oh, this is our triumphant thing for the good of the planet. This is America's best way to back out of a situation that they fucked up. Well, it's like, that's a foundational myth. Ronnie can't exactly say, well, yeah, that's a lie, but I did it for America. It's like, no, no, that's a lie that he can't have exposed. So I hope that gives you the idea of a uh, mortal wound as opposed to, you know, just a flesh wound that, that the country will forgive them for. So, yeah, in, in some of the in some of the ways, yeah. Oh, just one more on this thing is, is I think the left gets too hung up on the truth. We don't give a rat's ass about the truth. No one cares about the truth. The truth is inaccessible. There's no simple, nice package truth that Karl Marx said, you know, this is it, and the, you fact check this, and you. It's, everybody's got a bullshit story. It's, this is way too coming in right from the beginning. This is way too complex for anybody to understand. So don't even start by trying to get the truth. It doesn't matter. You're just trying to achieve a victory. So basically, you know, is anything goes, all's fair in love and war. And that's what the left never gets. They think, well, you have to fact check and make sure that it's right. And they say, no, come out with the biggest blasted bloody lie you can think of. So, for example, okay, so take Thacker Pass and stuff where they're, you know, campaigning against the lithium mine. Well, we have to be all moral and we have to go up to Thacker Pass and stuff. No, what the fucking right would do is they say, oh, lithium gives you cancer. It's like, oh, fuck, well, there goes the electric car. <laughs> it's like, done, Thacker Park is saved. <laughs> so, you see, that that's the... It okay. does. It does. Yeah, it's like, instead yeah. of like... Yeah. Uh, go, go, keep going, keep going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Volume. <laughs> Actually, I'll get the articles online for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> send that on the but, sub. But, but, but before you do that, you must line up the counterattack. So the kind of, you must also have people that are going to oppose that and shoot you down and fail in the end. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so so basically, have them write the counter argument, try and bury you, and also have their retraction pre-written. <laughs> yeah, you got to be like a Neo fighting all the Agent Smiths. <laughs> you got to be ready for all those punches coming at you. <laughs> No, but the thing is to make your own agent Smith. So, so the the real masterstroke is collusion. It, yeah, it's, ba it's basically you set up you set up the 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 thesis before Michael Sherman, Stephen Pinker, and you know Peterson and all these fucking shit for brains idiots. Before they get on the case. You make sure that basically somebody beats them to the punch and becomes your big adversary. Adversary, in quotes, that is basically de designed to basically take a dive in the third round. It's basically, it's it, everybody, this is what they did 
you know, in boxing rings. It's basically, they, they would pay people off to, to take a dive in the third round. And that's basically how you sucker the most money out of people. So you must, you must make sure that the best boxing fight you can have is one that's rigged. But that, that brings to mind, uh, uh, for example, a false, uh, a false debate on YouTube where you have picked your adversaries. And you defend, for example, the, the link between cancer and lithium and the danger of having an electric car, for example. And you have a panel in front of you of scientists and doctors and whatever industry. And, you know, you keep going. It's better to have one. You see, people like yeah. uh, primate brain is a big mono mono yeah, yeah. David and Goliath. But yeah, what's... Uh, what really works well is if you, if you, I mean, it's it's amateur wrestling. You 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 have Goliath and David. Everybody supports the underdog. They all support David. But you you know, David can't just walk in and smack Goliath because that's not what they came to see. Goliath has to go there and basically Goliath has to smack David down, and you're like, yeah, you're David, right? So then basically you smack, and when when the whole crowd is like you bastard you can't smack david down that hard at that point david gets up slingshot to goliath and everybody's wow <laughs> so it has to be done like that you have to propose that you know lithium causes cancer and then and then you're you're david you're the concerned doctor and stuff like this you must have goliath set up to come and you know basically crush you it would be ideal to have somebody on the inside that you know basically basically would trash their reputation for for this one gambit and then uh, yeah it's 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 yeah it's great it was class dismissed this uh, perfect lesson <laughs> so that's what I want. dr mike against dr sophie <laughs> oh no i, I would or you, we need real re reputable yeah. uh, scientists yeah. and doctors, yeah, yeah. 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 experts. You see, you see, it's it's such a good one that I would I would say you should put uh, time and effort into into setting it up. Basically, finding somebody that is is a name um, and you know is is agrees to act as the fall guy as an adversary. So, so I mean. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be be it just has to be a champion it doesn't it has to have to be a doctor you see I mean say you could get some take a name somebody like I'll just chuck a name at you like Monboyot or um, Rupert Reed or you know anybody that would take a dive theoretically for for the cause and you know the great thing about it is it's redeemable because they can take a dive when all the fu furor breaks out and everything the whole op is finished it's quite legitimate for them everybody to come and take a bow afterwards and said well we all fucked you over it was all planned you all just see that's also legitimate you can actually also redeem your very said yeah all i was trying to do was a psyops to tell you that evs are not the fucking solution thank you Encore! Oh, bravo! Lovely theater. So the the yeah, that's it's all psychology. Yeah. The the main thrust of the tactic uh, tactics tactics are just props to support the 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 theater and what the theater is who whoever has the best narrative wins. We 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 just we just fucking pro, you know. Hunter gatherers sitting around a fire listening to shamans tell stories. That's what the sages did in India. The, the Mahabharata is the, is the is, has probably the Library of Congress is smaller than the Mahabharata, and the Mahabharata was got by by exactly this. They had all the people sitting around a, a, a fire, and the shamans and sages would come up with the best story of the, you know the, of these deep things. What is the self? What is the point of life? And then, you know, that's how they winnowed it out. And the, the, the end result of that is one of the greatest works of literature by the epic of Gil Gilgamesh. And so, yes, that's 
that's what the the war is. It's a who who actually comes up with the best story. And it's not the truthful story. That's where everybody goes wrong. The truth yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, it has to be a good story. Like it, the it, the the interesting part is a good interesting so story, not whether or not it's true. That that part's fucking boring. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like is the historical Jesus true? It's like. No, it's the greatest story ever sold. It's the exactly biggest <laughs> story you've ever had. And look at it. I mean, come on, think of a better one. It's uh, well, you should think of a better one because Christianity <laughs> is run its course. <laughs> yeah, it, it's time for a new one, a new story. <laughs> Damn right, you're done with the that. The thing, one. the thing that's hard though is like. Um, you know, uh, creating creating that new myth because we're all a bunch of like um, demystified, you know, sub, uh, subjects from you know the uh, the benignment now. <laughs> so it's really uh, hard to get people's imaginations. Ah, here's the thing: raid the past. See, there's nothing new under the sun. Don't try and be creative or innovative. It's all been done. You go back to ancient Greece and start mining. You see, all this stuff in like Quebec and on and stuff, all these things about cults and things like that is they all raiding the past. You see, yeah, it's like uh, the archetypes, right? The the yeah. the hero with a thousand faces. Yeah. Yeah. The new the new story is an old story. It's it's yeah. it's always like that. It's, you see, it's, it, it, it's it's like cuisine, right? You you're never gonna. If you start experimenting with food, you're not going to find a food combination like cheese and tomato. You're never going to beat that, you know, <laughs> or cheese and onion or something. That, those old favorites are, are, are basically everybody's done everything you can possibly do in the kitchen. You're not going to find a magic kind of food combination. You can find an interesting one and you can have nouveau cuisine for a short while, and people will say, well, whoever knew that mango and sardines actually were a f flavor but it's not gonna last <laughs> mango and sardines is not one of the great flavor combinations yeah uh, it, it's like uh i love that uh one it's uh one of your um zoo in your head videos at the end where you're talking about the core of Bonti's, like beating the drums so like you can be reborn and then you come out as zeus to destroy chronos yeah that's really awesome yeah 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 so yeah, the carbon is a big deal. But but yeah, so the, the, the idea is you can't really come up with anything new. So don't even try. Just go back and you know find a forgotten dish. So if you can you can always or or, or just rehash a dish that's um, you know same old, same old, but like dress it in a new way, represent it in a new way. And everybody says, like, oh peach melba? Well I was fucking new. And you're like, no, nah, not really. It's just everybody forgot it. But like, you know, Pavlova, or whatever. Just you, you can always find something forgotten that was dynamite. And you say, why did we forget? You see, the way the narrative, the human narrative works is one of the big lies we tell ourselves in the Western world is, is that knowledge is accumulative. It's complete nonsense. We're not accumulating knowledge. It's the knowledge we have is like a moving spotlight or a window and it's like a conversation so if you've ever been you know at a cocktail party or a dinner party and you had this great conversation people come up with they say some dynamite things but then some other idiot talks over the top of them and the conversation goes down a new path and you're like if you recorded that whole conversation you would go back and say wait a minute nobody noticed that fred here said something fucking interesting but the conversation didn't go that route. It went down some other route. Now, that's what science is doing. That's what knowledge is doing. It's forgetting stuff on the tail end just as much as it's finding stuff on the new end. We're not going anywhere. It's a myth that we're accumulating knowledge. Yeah, chasing yeah. chasing our tail, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so what you can do knowing that, you can go back in the conversation. You see, it's all recorded in literature and now you know, even in film and stuff is now this big archive. And with you go back to the forgotten shit and just read it. That's what everybody did. That's what Hitler did. He just went to the occult. That's what that's what um uh you know Alistair Crowley and all these guys they, they uh you know uh Freud he was a big fraud. He he raided them all. <laughs> or, or Jung raided them all. They they were just basically thieves. 
But <laughs> don't, don't, don't try and do anything. Just, just say, like, we're all thieves. And you just go back, read some forgotten thing. Um, they're gems. They're gems all over the place. Go and look at Thomas Middleton, completely forgotten playwright. Uh, probably better than Shakespeare. He was more famous than Shakespeare in his time. He, he basically sold more tickets. <laughs> uh, he, he was the more successful playwright than Shakespeare. The reason why we don't remember him is because he was a little bit bawdy and he was a little bit too close to the bone. So he was a little, Thomas Middleton was a lot more like me and uh, lot, and, and, and so that doesn't have a long shelf life. Shakespeare endures because you can teach Shakespeare to you know high school kids without blushing. But yeah. <laughs> we, we would teach Thomas Middleton, but it's a little bit too saucy for school kids. And that's yeah. the only reason why you've heard of Shakespeare and you haven't heard of Thomas Middleton. Shakespeare, by the way, was Edward de Vere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I, so, so yeah, I'm just painting that as just raid, raid, raid ancient Greece, raid the occult, raid, raid you know. Freemasonry, Rosa Christians. Yeah, you know, Except speaking of uh, speaking of raiding, so you know that Norse myth of like Odin, Hugin, and Munin, right? I thought of something interesting with that. So basically, like um, Munin is memory, and then Hugin is thought. And I started thinking maybe what happened with us is Hugin flew away and never came back, and then Munin memory is like ancestral memory too. So like our bodies, and then the earth. And so maybe like um, Hugin flew away and got stuck into the abstract realm. <laughs> and you can make a myth about we have to get Hugin back and then tether our thoughts to reality. Yeah, immediate thoughts in the present moment. Yeah. yeah. Hey, okay, well, well, maybe we end on that note. And let's, <laughs> what I suggest is we do exactly that. So, so you remember the exercise that everybody's probably forgotten already? <laughs> <laughs> Should we do the exercise right right now as uh, just as a as an exit? Okay. Exit exit to this little okay. little little seance we're doing. I'll, I'll try and make it as culty and creepy as I can. Uh, without the music. <laughs> I I don't know. What do you think with the music? I'm down with either. I don't mind. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's let's do it silent. Just for we'll see how this goes. We we'll do the we'll see it next time. Okay. So, okay. So 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 sit balanced with your spine straight. Your hands on your thighs, and relax your face. Relax your neck, your shoulders. Make sure that your stomach is not tight and not relaxed either, just comfortable. Check your thighs are relaxed. Feel the weight on your chair. Feel your feet on the floor. Come back to your face and make sure that you have no tension in your eyebrows, your eyes around your jaw, back of your neck again, and just release any tension you feel there. Slowly bring your attention to the back of your eyelids and just focus on the, you may see a light there. Um, and if you can focus on that, but otherwise just look behind your eyelids into the middle distance, full still, let your attention go to your hearing, hear the most distant sound, and go out to that sound, let the sound come into you, stay embodied in your body, with your attention focused between your eyes, make sure that your face is relaxed, do another inventory from head to toe, make sure everything is relaxed or deeply still. Notice your breathing. Without moving your tongue, notice any taste in your mouth. Notice any smell or just feel the air in your nostrils. 
Keep a general sense of awareness. Fall deeply still. Om Paramatma Nenama Iti. Okay. How was that? <laughs> I kind of feel refreshed, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, you should. You should. Maybe, maybe we should do it every time on the way out, and, and eventually we should maybe do it on the way in. But it makes for a very funny entry <laughs> intro. <laughs> yeah, I could just see people like. Should we do that on Friday with Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> Oh, that'll bum him up. Yeah, that'll, <laughs> that'll, yeah, that'll, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, let's uh, see what he does. Yeah, because he's, yeah. He's, he's running a cult. He's running a cult. He doesn't know it, but he's running yeah. a cult. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, you know, so we, yeah, I think it could be, we could suggest that. I, I tried to remember, we tried to remember that on, on Friday to to start like, like that. <laughs> oh, no, let's finish off. No, no, no. We'll finish no. off with it. Yeah. I, Otherwise, that might dominate the whole conversation. Now, let, let's, yes. catch a, let's ambush him at the end and do that. Right? Should we yeah. do it at the end? We ambush him. And yeah, so yeah. The, the conversation is a good way to spin it up, and then you pressure release valve at the end. <laughs> yeah. He might, he might like it actually. Uh, you know, he might, he might like it. You know. No. Oh, and that'll freak him yeah. out. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he'll know what to do with it. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, don't do that exercise anyway during the, the week. Um, mm -hmm. It's 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 golden to just uh, you know often as you like, but it, it's like taking a hit of a bong whenever you need it. It's like yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, yeah. Tell us what 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 happens when you do it. If you if you do it during the week, then we'll discuss it in the next meeting. Okay. Thank all you right. very much. Yeah. All right, well, Good. thanks, everybody. Nice to see you all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks, yeah, Bye. Be safe Thank out you. there. See you next week. Yeah, be safe. Stay